Welcome to the SpartanMag.com, VCast, Jim Comproni, Paul Konerdijk at uh, Lucas Oil Stadium, Indianapolis, Indiana. Big Ten Media Days. Right back in football season, Paul. Jonathan Smith here. First time Jonathan Smith, of course, has been this. First year, been at this. First year coach at Michigan State. I thought he was relaxed. I thought he was um, sincere and, and uh, uh, detailed in his approach, but not over the top. I thought he was comfortable. What were your thoughts about John, Jonathan Smith and the players and, and his message today and your, and your takeaways? Well, from I, I think, first off, the whole event is a lot different than it used to be. Yeah. I mean, it's really kind of like boring. I'm not not boring in a sense of well, b boring in a sense of it's not like frantic. It's more laid back because it's spread out across three days with uh, schools on different days. It's not as you don't have as much uh, you know hustle and bustle. There's fewer players out here. There's fewer you know fewer like it, it's less chaotic. Um, it's kind of more staged, and uh, so I think it lends itself to a more laid back atmosphere. But then again, you look at Jonathan Smith as a guy who's. I've uh, been a head coach for uh, this will be his seventh year as a head coach. Six at like Oregon that. State, yeah. and uh, this will, first at Michigan State. But he's been through this uh, this rodeo, and I think he said it best when he was talking about the rebuilding job at Michigan State. He said he doesn't feel like he's drinking out of a fire hose, and that's how he felt when he was at Oregon State the first year, um, when he was kind of going through the ebbs and flows and peaks and valleys and all that stuff. Uh, I think he, there is more of a relaxed thing. He knows how to run a program, and uh, he feels confident in what he's doing and in, in where the program is headed. And uh, I think everything he did today, body language-wise, I, I think backed that up. Yeah. Um, we learned a few things talking to Jonathan Smith today. Um, again, not, not, as, not as revealing as it used to be. In the old days, he'd do 15 minutes and then maybe 10 minutes in the, in the, in the hallway, Mark D'Antonio used to, or even going back to other coaches. And then the next day, you'd have like an hour and 20-minute roundtable. Two-hour round roundtable. Two Two-hour roundtable. Yeah. And you'd only have maybe five or six riders around, and you'd go over like every position too deep and a lot, a lot more uh, in depth. This, there's no hallway. It's just what you saw at the Big Ten Network, and then Paul had the video up 30 minutes over at SpartanMag.com on, on the channel here, the SpartanMag YouTube channel. Probably time for maybe what nine or ten questions. Well, more than that, but there's like maybe nine or ten serious questions. I mean, you still have the, you know, you still have kind of the lame type of questions on, you know, like Oregon writers trying to talk to, or people that cover mm -hmm. the Pac-12 trying to kind of bait him a little bit on Oregon and that type of stuff, or, or those kind of things are like, you know, Jack Valley had to answer questions from USC writers and Oregon writers and, and whatnot, but um, there's not as much roster type type questions, and I'm my feel today is that Jonathan Smith didn't really open himself up to many roster questions. Like when he was asked about certain positions, he would talk about how he feels good, but he wouldn't talk about individuals. Mm -hmm. And when you don't talk about specific individuals, um, you know, outside of a handful, the guys that he brought with him, but when you don't talk about individuals, you kind of really don't open yourself up to the real uh, you know, player development type stuff. And, and in year one, I don't think he wants to talk too much about, you know, player development. He wants everyone, uh, everyone hungry and, and everyone on the, on the same page. And I, and I think he's got that. Yeah. I, at the podium, I asked him about the offensive line and, you know, at what point can they start to gain traction or something worse to that effect. And he mentioned that he was optimistic, but then also without being asked about the offensive line, he brought it up here at the secondary podium press conference thing. And he said, he said, I'm confident. He said, uh, he said, I'm optimistic even on the offensive line. There's talent there. But like you said, didn't mention one offensive lineman. I'm not. I'm not saying it should, but if it were a roundtable situation, we could go through and ask about each one of them. Where does Luke Newman fit in? You know, what do you think about? Uh, you know, is, can, is Lepo? Uh, he's added some weight. You know, those things don't get discussed now, whereas ten years ago they would have. But what I do think was interesting was you know him talking about cross training offensive linemen and playing them at different positions and. And it was from a guy that, you know, like trust his offensive line coach. We know that Mahal Chuck is a really good offensive line coach. I was impressed with him whenever we had spring spring football practice. We had an opportunity to watch him. But you could see a little bit of, like, how they're thinking. You know, we don't know what Luke Newman might play, but he's going to be probably oiled up to play multiple positions. Mm -hmm. You know, same thing with, you know, tackles will be cross-trained at guards. And it's more than just lip service. We used to hear that a lot. Well, I want these guys cross-trained. But I think Mahal Chuck is really, really good at that. And uh, and it shows on it shows like in, in what they were able to do in the offensive line in Oregon State. Yeah, Tanner Miller last year began as right guard, and then he played center, 
when there were some injuries for the starting center and the plan at Oregon State was Tanner Miller was going to become the starting center this year and of course a coaching change happens he goes in the portal ends up following Jonathan Smith and Mahalchik to Michigan State Tanner Miller after one week of spring practice, they knew right away he was going to be the center long term. So cross-trained at two positions, he's going to be the, the center this year for Michigan State. Luke Newman's an interesting one. Wrote about him at SpartanMag.com a couple weeks ago, going over every position on the offensive line, coming in from Holy Cross. And I watched every snap of Holy Cross against Boston College. I didn't want to see them against Dartmouth and Lehigh or whatever. I want to see them against Boston College. I watched every offensive snap. I focused on him at left tackle. And, Paul, I know it was Boston College just one game, but – and, uh, and I'm not Gil Brandt when it comes to analyzing players, but it, it looked to me like he was a better offensive tackle last year in that game than Michigan State had at either offensive tackle in any game all season. Now he's coming to Michigan State as a guard initially, but he is cross-training this, this summer, and it would not su- surprise me if at some point he works in and becomes a tackle, whether it be by, by – um, uh, attrition or you know net emergency or whatever but he's another guy in the program that can play solvent offensive tackle he's six foot four so he's not like an ideal offensive tackle so if Leppo and 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 uh, Baldwin the left and right tackles during the spring if they can come around and, and improve then 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 Michigan State has a luxury of having Newman possibly at guard but uh, we won't know much more about that probably till the first game kicks off and into a, a couple of games. But Newman was an important one to bring in. Right. And the other, you know, the, the other thing that would have been nice is if we had like a full player development breakdown. And, and it's hard to get in, the, in year one of a program. But like, I'd like to know how a guy like Stanton Ramil is doing or what, what kind mm-hmm. of offseason he had because he's the guy that came into the program with so much promise, had the injury, and basically haven't heard anything you know about him since Mm -hmm. um but he's a guy that i thought when he was coming in that he had a chance to be a real difference maker in the offensive line i I felt like he was on a track to be playing early as well um you know not often do guys play as true freshmen on the offensive line but some good ones do and i thought he was going to have a chance to maybe be one of those kind of kind of guys but the injury obviously was a setback um it would be a pleasant surprise to see a guy like him um, kind of emerge during training camp, like if we kind of hear if we kind of hear some stuff about him. But it'd also be a pleasant surprise if a guy on the defensive line, like an Alex Van Sumeren, mm-hmm. uh, you know, came around. And that's kind of uh, some of the things we'd like to be keeping our, our ears open for. Um, you know, at, at the same time, in year one, I don't think ever, anyone's going to be super forthcoming with uh, you know nuggets of information. Now, some stuff slips out. Sometimes you see highlights and whatnot. Um, and we'll be able to tell a little bit more when we see we see practice. Uh, those guys didn't play in the spring, so uh, it'll be nice to see some guys moving around out there. But I think the vote of confidence uh, when you talk about offensive line, it, I think it has to do with some of the bodies that were in the program, but I think it also has to do with the faith in the offensive line coach, mm-hmm. his operation, what they do, and uh, – in their entire run game operation. I think Christian Phillips at left guard is a guy that potentially may have come further than anyone on this roster in the last 12 months. He was first string left guard during the spring. He played more snaps than anybody in the, in the spring scrimmage. He played with the ones and the twos. I think they're trying to test to see right. what his endurance was. Um, it remains to be seen whether he can do it in, in games in the fall and so forth. But, but for someone for two years who had never been on the field, basically, except for expert, extra point protection, they saddled him with an important role in the spring, and I think in a, in a sink-or-swim situation, he was able to swim in that environment. That's, that's just spring practice, just a couple of scrimmages. But there seems to be some confidence in him, and, uh, and you know that, that's a guy that, they, that you would think they, that they perceive to have some talent. Still an unproven player, likely a starter, but there's going to be a competition there because Gavin Brocious is there at left guard, looked functional in the spring game. And Brocious, we talked about uh, weight gains and weight losses with the official roster that was released today. Brocious is a guy that ever, that added about 12 pounds. Had a pretty good spring there at left guard, added some weight. I think he's on an uptick as well as some others. There's some notable things in terms of the, the weight gains and weight losses uh, that, that, were, that were released. Yeah, it, it, I mean, the, the end goal is to get the best five on the field, obviously, but um, it, it's going to be interesting. I, I really think... Uh, I really think there are going to be some guys that's, that we maybe aren't getting a lot of buzz right now, but end up stepping up and end up. Phillips would be a guy to keep an eye on, but Brocious is another guy that I, I can see making some big gains. You mentioned Stanton Ramil looked real good coming in. Um, has had some had an injury last year off for the season. Um, then 
Mahalchik told me that he had a setback during the spring. Didn't right. elaborate on that. But in the the weight gains, he was up. He gained about eight pounds. So he was one of the more notable weight gain guys on the roster compared that, to the spring. Is that a good because of his frame is so big? Is that a good thing? I mean, you can see guys move up in weight. Did he gain weight because he hasn't been, you know, he hasn't been working out as much, or, you know, I'm like, guessing it's good mass. I'm hope so. I hope so. But sometimes. It, I guess if it was bad mass, it'd be 20 pounds, right? Yeah. Um, Van Sumeren's a guy that added about eight or nine pounds. And I asked Jonathan Smith about Van Sumeren and Amarian Smith specifically today because it's a couple of guys that played a little bit in 2022, I think. And Amarian Smith was 2023, only played a couple of games, lost for the season. Van Sumeren played four games in 2022, shut it down, red shirt. Then last year was injured in August, missed the entire season, missed in, and sat out the spring. But every time I go to the football building, I wrote this, every time I'm at the football building, which is infrequently, it's not all the time, but any time we're there for, a, for official events here and there, Van Sumeren is in the hallways. He's, I get the idea he's living there. Meanwhile, I saw him in Moneyball last week. I mean, Van Sumeren's around. Then you hear some, and I wrote this also earlier today. You can check it out at SpartanMag.com. Van Sumeren is doing some really good things in the weight room. He's pushing around some really good weight. He's impressed some people mm -hmm. there. So he adds nine pounds. He's impressing people as in the weight room as he gets into his 20s, into his man years a little bit more. We've not seen him except for those four games of 2022 when he was a true freshman playing a position that true freshmen usually don't play. So Van Sumeren at a position, by the way, that is critical, defensive tackle, a position at which Michigan State lost two starters, Barrow and, and Derek Harmon, very important position. He's an important person. It's not like as observers we know what he is or you know what he's going to be. But So that's an X factor that could be a positive. In the meantime, give us a like here at the channel, SpartanMag.com. Subscribe to the channel. That will help us a lot also. Go over to SpartanMag.com. Subscribe. One dollar. Get you a month. You can test it out, SpartanMag.com coverage, as we head into the coverage of Spartan Mag preseason, Spartan football preseason practice beginning next Tuesday. Coverage and analysis all through the month of July and into August heading into the season. But Van Sumeren is interesting. We haven't seen him play football in 22 months. Important position. He's gaining some weight, hearing some good things. I asked Smith about him. Smith said, yeah, we're looking forward to Smith and Van Sumeren being a part of it. But that's about it. He doesn't really expand on those because he's not been on the practice field with those guys with pads either. But the safety position, same type of thing. There's been some attrition there, a transfer, a guy that played a little bit last year. Those are interesting guys that we haven't seen play a lot of football. Yeah, I thought coming in, Van Sumeren was a guy with a lot of talent. Obviously, he's highly ranked. But he's also a guy that was injured coming in on a – out of high school football, you know, he had the shoulder, he he had the shoulder, shoulder. injury that, that took away a few games uh, towards the end of his senior season. I'm not sure if that required surgery or not, but he's a guy that played a lot of football in high school, he played a lot of football while he was banged up. So it's nice to see him, you know, presumably moving in the right direction, doing some good things in, in the weight room. But basically, Jim, the bottom line is uh, even if he's not the player he was ranked to be, they need someone that can be somewhat functional at that, that size. Sure. They just don't have the bodies, and you need, I mean, you need 300-pound bodies or in that range between 275 and 300 pounds, depending on what kind of defense you play. Um, but you need big-bodied athletes to play the defensive tackle position, and if you don't have them, um, then you can't do what you need to do on defense. And Daquan Dallas was an interesting one. They brought in from Georgia Tech, made some plays in the spring game, but he was only playing at 282 pounds. He's up 17 pounds. He's the biggest weight gainer in the program. So he's coming to a new conference, went through the spring, comes back in August 17 pounds heavier. Now, some of that weight will get shed as they get into August camp a little bit, but I'm reading between the lines there that he thought he needed to pack on some more mass to play this season in the Big Ten. Smith was asked about it today, and he didn't go into specifics, but he said, yeah, you know, gained some weight, and good guy, we need him, or whatever he said. Jonathan Smith is very um, economical with his comments. You ask him a question, he'll answer it in two sentences. He won't go on for, for 10 minutes like maybe Tom Izzo will, which will delve into what's wrong in the universe. But I do think that, <laughs> especially when it's a defensive guy, he's not, you know, yeah. you're, you're going to get more out of Joe Rossi. But from, from my, uh, you know, from my perspective, Dallas was one of the more intriguing players in the mm -hmm. spring. He, he, didn't, he didn't start the spring healthy. Uh, he finished the spring, spring healthy, and, and I think um, there's a lot of buzz at the end of spring from some of the guys in the program about what he was doing. They thought he was a plus player, made some plays in those scrimmages. Um, and with that weight, I think he'll be able to carry it well. 
uh, you know, without losing the athleticism. He's, yeah. You know, like some of the, some guys you put on weight and they can't move. He's very twitchy. I think, uh, you know, he moves pretty well. And they, I think they're really lucky to get him from uh, from Georgia Tech. Yeah, that was a pretty good one. Didn't realize it at the time, but that was an important one. I mean, We didn't on, know how important that was going to be. Based on what the players were saying, you know, like some of the stuff that you hear, like some of the guys in the program were really impressed with him. Yeah, and they got him before Barrow and Harmon left. Um, bringing him in, I would have, I would, I would have thought as like a second string type of role, a guy that's got 20 stars at Georgia Tech to come to right. Michigan State, probably to be a second stringer, and then oh by the way, those two guys leave, and now he's an important guy, adds weight, and and they move forward. Um, you know, I don't know if it was asked this specifically, but remember when D'Antonio used to come to this, he would have like a different mantra every year, and he tried to, it was kind of branding it, and he'd put it, you know, like some of them, keep reaching and reach higher. Some all of them stuff. were great, and some of them really flopped hard. Yeah. Um, I don't know if he was asked specifically for a mantra, but he did mention the word mantra, and he said low ego, high output, which is what he said when he was hired, right. and I suspect it's going to be that way 365 days of the year going forward. No change to that mantra ever. Yeah, and I noticed the difference with some of the players. Man. Like, you know, like even like Dylan Tatum, you know, like when you used to ask him a question like what – like. What would you, you know, like you're playing this position, what do you want to play? And he'd go on five minutes about how he thought he's really this position when he's playing this one because he's unselfish. You know, I noticed a difference between some of those guys. It's like, it's not about them as much. And like even Dylan Tatum today, he's like, you know, I'll, I'll play wherever, wherever they need me to. It was more of a, I'm not saying it's humility, but it was more of a, in my opinion, just based on a couple statements from, from Tatum, I thought, because here's a guy that sometimes doesn't have a filter. I, I thought he was a little bit more reserved. I thought he's a little bit more like humble in a good way. Not that he was disrespectful or any, anything before. It was more of a team first, you know, team centric kind of mindset for uh, for Dylan Tatum. That's why that, that's that was one of my takeaways from him. Just in cutting up some video. What about um, Nathan Carter, running back, and Jack Velling, the tight end? Uh, did you hear what they had to say? Any takeaways from what what they said? Nate Carter's just excited to be here. I mean, excited to be like not not just here. I mean, he's excited to be here because he remembers watching the Kirk Cousins speech way back in the day and and uh, and being um, inspired by that. Uh, but he's just excited to be at Michigan State. And I thought, that, you know, I'm going to write a little story about this in, in a few minutes. Um, but him talking about, you know, like you and I were talking about before he even spoke today about after that Penn State game, him saying he was going to be coming back. He just felt like Michigan State's a place that he would be, that he would want to be, whether he's playing football or not, and kind of felt like he didn't use the words it was home, but I think after starting out at UConn, he found kind of his uh, place where he wanted to be at Michigan State, and he's just excited to be the fact that he's playing for a football program that runs the ball, um, you know, really believes in running the football, but he thinks that Michigan State's a special place, and he wanted to be there, and uh, he's really excited about his opportunities. One of the things I asked him about, because I know Jonathan Smith has mentioned it. I, something I watched in the spring is I think he's a lot more comfortable catching the ball out of the backfield. I felt like that was an area where he wasn't utilized very much. You know, it was like last year, it was like Jalen Berger's our guy catching the ball out of the backfield. Uh, I think Nate Carter had maybe five catches, you, you know, like probably five catches and six or seven targets. He was solid, but he looks a lot better catching the ball out of the backfield. He likes what they do, some of their scheme stuff, um, to get to get people the ball out of the backfield. Uh, he feels comfortable about um, – his role, um, he feels really good about, you know, kind of like where he is as a tailback, and he likes, you know, he likes the the guys that they brought in. He likes the the, the tailback from from UMass that they brought in, um, and he feels like he's a good that they're very complimentary that they fit well together. Yeah, Kron Lynch Adams is the name running back, and he was listed last year at UMass at at five ten five eleven two hundred and five pounds. On the roster today is two fifteen. So the running back coming in from UMass, apparently he's added 10 pounds. He's 215, so he's on film. He's going to be bigger. Over 1,000 yards rushing last year. I asked Smith about him a little bit, and he says he thinks he's uh, enough of a different change of pace to complement Nathan Carter. So the two running backs, not what you would have seen two years ago, but a couple of capable guys. Yeah, and then the freshmen that came in, I really like those guys. Yeah. I mean, like, like the, um, the Tulis. Um, Brandon Tullis. Yeah, I thought, you know, both those guys from Texas, I, I think that, that uh, Keith Bonafa has a really good eye for talent. He's proven that, you know, where when he was at Boise State, when he was at Washington, um, you know, like he does a really good job with tailbacks. And uh, he really knows Texas well. 
And, uh, you know, he feels like when he gets, like, both those guys play linebacker in high school as well. He feels like there's some value to getting those guys that play both sides of the football. And he feels like when you have guys that play both sides of the football and play linebacker or another defensive position well, that they're not really topped out at running back because they're, you know, they're working on multiple things. And he feels like there's a little extra there that you get out of those guys once they focus on one position and there's a little toughness there. But um, I like those guys from Texas. I think, uh, you know, the guys with linebacker background, D'Antonio used to do that. You know, you think of Le'Veon Bell coming in, you know, and uh, and some of those other guys. Um, I think those guys are going to fit well with the upperclassmen, but the the kid from UMass uh, one year, uh, he wants to do his thing at Michigan State and uh, excited to play in a, in a program that's friendly to running backs. As far as Jack Felling goes, um, I think he's happy to play in this system. He knows that tight end is going to get the ball a lot. He feels comfortable with the offense. He feels comfortable that they're going to run the football. Um, you know, they're going to get the ball to the tight end and, and they're going to go over the top. One of the things that Jack Felling said, um, today is, you know, the one thing we know about this offense is we're going to, you know, we're going to run the football and we're going to score a lot of points. You know, like I don't, that doesn't sound earth shattering based on what they did at Oregon State, but if most Michigan State fans hear that, they'll be like, yeah, I'll believe it when I can see it based on what we've seen over recent years. But there's a confidence level in the ability to move the football. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some, con- it's, it's going to be interesting, but, you know, between him, Jack Velling, you got some young tight ends, I think, that are, that are pretty solid. You, you, Jonathan Smith was really high in Montori Foster yeah. again. We mm-hmm. keep on hearing that name. And Foster works. I mean, he's a worker. It'll be interesting to see if they can kind of put it all together and avoid injuries to key guys. Mm-hmm. But um, there seems to be a confidence within the offensive players that, hey, we're going to be able to move the ball. Yeah, and Montori Foster keeps steadily improving. And you think about that one-handed catch he made for a touchdown against either Rutgers or Indiana in a key moment. I think Indiana spring game, the way he trucked Jalen Thompson, the freshman Jalen Thompson, not the defensive lineman. You know, Foster keeps getting you know bigger and stronger. And when when Jonathan Smith talked about Montori Foster today, he he raised his eyebrows and the voice inflection, you know, leads you to believe that he was he is genuinely impressed and even pleasantly surprised with Foster when he was asked about the wide receiver position. Everybody knows Nick Marsh has a lot of ability as well, and I think Elante Brown has more to offer than he showed last year had a nightmare season in terms of uh, special teams and so forth uh, had a good spring can he bounce back let to wait and see but Jonathan Smith said I'm con- he, he talked about those receivers the tight end Carter out of the backfield Aiden Childs get some pass protection and he said I'm confident we can have an effective passing game unquote and it wasn't his word salad I think he, he said it and I believe that he really thinks that yeah one of the yeah I think so and, and one of the interesting th- things to me is like he feels like with this this helmet thing with it, you know, they've got the communication in the helmet that that's going to give them a little edge. No more signs, Paul? Right. And when you huddle and you've got a communication in the helmet and he feels like the huddle. And I know a lot of people out there are like, why would you huddle? That's bad. But I think he's right. You know, with a, with, a, with an offense like Lindgren runs with some window dressing and, you know, they do a lot of stuff to you formationally uh, where if one guy gets out of position, you can ex- exploit that. When you get the helmet communication coming out of the huddle, I think that can be – a fairly big advantage for you and uh, I think you know Jonathan Smith's looking for an edge and I think he's excited about that and you know the other thing you mentioned in terms of not just communication but you can give guys real-time nuggets of information mm-hmm. that you know like hey watch this safety this guy's mm-hmm. doing this this linebacker's doing this you know or you know these splits are a little bit off you can get you can take advantage of this but I, I think they're really looking at, at that as, a, as an opportunity to do some things um, and I'm kind of eager to see where that goes for a young, for a young quarterback. I think that's very, very beneficial. Yeah, and he, like you said, he he said that they used the huddle to their advantage at Oregon State. And if you go back and watch them play, you can see that because Oregon State is so varied with their formations. Like they can have the same personnel, and on first down they're five wide, a running right. back split out, and the tight ends are split out. And then on second down, it's 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 two back, you know, phone booth football. If you disguise those things in a huddle and come over the ball quickly, and I, sometimes they'll huddle and come to the line. Sometimes they huddle and sprint to the line, and the defense is, is like hurriedly trying to find out where Velling is this last year at Oregon State. Where's the running back, you know, and the ball snapped. And they might just run a, a power run anyway. But you, when he said today they try to use the huddle, huddling to their advantage, you can see that uh, last year. Now you add that with a quarterback who's inexperienced, and you can tell Smith is like, you know, yeah, we, we, we welcome that, that change. So It's interesting, too, because it's like we talk about, like, the formational stuff we saw at Oregon State, but how, how fast do Michigan State players pick that up to where it's effective? You know, because there is a, there is a, 
an element of you have to like you know repeat stuff over and over and over again before you can get that you know that seamlessness you know it's not like you can't just pick it up uh in a couple of minutes mm -hmm. and uh so there probably will be some early early growing pains and sure. it'll be interesting if they, when they play the when they play teams that are in that Pac-12 mode that are coming into the conference that have seen Michigan State, um, the, the Oregon State version of Michigan State, you know, they'll be ready for some of that stuff. Sure. And, um, you know, he was asked about, you know, are you, is, is a bowl game uh, a goal this year? You know, can you get to a bowl game? And he didn't come out and say it, but he said, we're definitely going to try to win more than we lose. And right. he said that a couple times and well, very matter-of-factly. Um, you know, year one, Saban went to a bowl game. Year one, Jonathan Smith went to a bowl game. Year one, Bobby Williams did not go to a bowl game. Year one, Mel Tucker did not go to a bowl game. More year one, Mark D'Antonio did go to a bowl game. Yeah. So it's within. It's easier to go to a bowl game now than it was maybe in 1995. But the, they are teetering right in there in a very tough conference, but a manageable schedule in some ways. That's going to be the barometer this this year, and he's not shying away from it. it yeah, I, yeah, and he, Alan Haller he, said he as get the idea to be dis he would be disappointed if they don't get a bowl game. That's I, that was my read. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure of that. And they didn't. The players were asked about you know like low expectations. Or do you think you can have a winning season? Most of those guys were like, yeah, we. We think that obviously they're going to say that, but Alan Hale, our athletic director, Michigan State athletic director, said just as much as like we want to go to a bowl game this year. That's important to the program, and um, and I don't think you know like I know that the over and under for Michigan State on wins this year is four and a half. Uh, Las Vegas, a lot, of, a lot of people, prognosticators pick Michigan State 16th in the conference. I get that, but that's based on you know like what what Jonathan Smith said today is you know that's ba that's all all that is is based on what happened last year, mm -hmm. what happened in recent years. Of Michigan State under underachieving. Now he didn't use that word underachieving, but that's I think in his sense uh, what he felt. He feels like the guys that are in the program that there's probably more talent than people realize. I think uh, that he's kind of indicated that, but he also feels like these guys have a higher care factor than people might realize as well. So um, you know, to get to a bowl game, you have to avoid certain things. You can't like you look at the the depth on the both lines. You can't have catastrophic number of injuries. There's no way to replace some of those guys, but um, you know, if they have a, if they have a little bit of good luck, they have high player development, um, and you know, guys that they think are can perform perform at a high level. Um, I, I think it's I think it's doable. If you look at last year, even I mean, look at last year and the year before, they were close in some ways. You know, things. I mean, they were they weren't they were disappointing seasons, but yeah, you know, like it's not much of a difference between four wins and six wins or whatever. It right. usually comes down to a handful of plays. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, I think it's kind of to a large degree, it's going to have to come down to, you know, Michigan state for Aiden Childs being a, a young quarterback, he's going to need a running game. That's, a, that's yes. effective. Yes. You know, even last year when he was at Oregon state, yeah, he played a series, uh, a handful of series, but the one concept for him is that when he came in, uh, he had a run game, and they had the threat of the run, and Absolutely. it was and it was very effective. And, uh, and a young quarterback, I don't care how talented he is, how much arm talent he has, um, if you want a young quarterback to win, you need to be able to run, you know, run the football. Um, you can maybe supplement it with him scrambling or whatever, but you know, like they did with Brian Lewerke and like when he was a first year starter, full time first year starter in 2010. Um, but you got to be able to run the football, and I think that's going to be the biggest thing. So. If Smith is right, and if that offensive line can do some more than people give him credit for, then then maybe that maybe that bowl game is 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 within reach, potentially. But if they can't run the football, mm -hmm. um, I don't think this defense has the personnel capable of playing heavy minutes on a consistent basis, and you know, and keeping them in games. They're going to have to score points. Um, and they're going to have to do it fairly regularly. Possess the ball. Possess, get some field they're position. They're going to have to possess the ball, but they're going to have to, you know, take advantage of red red zone scoring opportunities and not field goals. They're going to have to get some touchdowns, but um, they're going to have to help their defense out. It's going to have to be a group effort, um, and, and you can't do that on offense if you can't run the football. I agree. You've got to run the ball, uh, and that's predicated on the offensive line and getting into the right play, which Tanner Miller will help with with right. a young quarterback. But in order for child to have success, got to run the ball. In order for the team to success, got to run the ball. Got to have the offensive line come around. Big variable. Michigan State, a big unknown. Um, they fell quite a bit last year to 4-8, and eight, and they've really changed the roster over quite a bit with, I don't know, 40-plus new faces. 
but it's still Michigan State and still some pretty good players, pretty good transfers coming in. And in my estimation, a very good head coach who's not trying to cut any corners, not trying to skip any steps. That's a phrase that Big Mooby used. I agree with it exactly. They're, they're not trying to skip any steps. They're going step by step by step. Where they will in this building process, where will they land in September? Not sure. And the game at Maryland, the game at Boston College, those are huge games in terms of, um, you know, deciding what direction this season is going to go because those middle four games in the, in the middle of the year there's going to be a losing streak in there so putting it, putting those two away in September is going to be key swing games depending on what the, to, to to have an impact on what they do in 2024 and that's been a huge problem for Michigan State the last two years where I think they were terrible they're terrible and winnable games early in the season you know and that that again speaks to the, the whole quality control element you know there's times where they ran the football effectively you know Kind of towards towards the you know final third of the season, but like I, I think of the Maryland games that Michigan State has played the last couple of years, um, you know where they really didn't take advantage of any chances that they had against those guys and kind of uh, threw some of those games away. You got to beat teams that are in your peer group. Yeah, that's game two. That's a that's a big one. That's, that's really a tough big. game for the second game of the year. Yeah, and they're they're going through a new quarterback. You know, it's more of an established program out there at Maryland. It's not the a hostile environment, so that's that's a big tester for Michigan State. That's going to have a big impact on whether they get to six wins or seven wins or something like that, or if they become mired in a five win type of season. If they can run the football, if they can get that, you know, if they can get that running game, which is such a huge part of the offense, like going a little bit, that'll help them a lot at Maryland. All right, also, uh, before we wrap it up, you know, Jonathan Smith asked three or four times about Michigan. You know, what's your relationship with Sharon Moore? You know, what do you think about the rivalry? Does, did Sharon Moore get asked about Michigan State here? Do you think that'll happen? Uh, He's asked, he gets asked about Ohio State probably. But, right, but he also – I mean, we, we've been gotta, doing this for 20 years. Uh, every year, what about Michigan? What about, what about Michigan? Well, today it was more like I, – I understand that, what about Michigan stuff, and I know you're going to bring it up. But for me, today it was more about what about Oregon. What about Oregon? Because he, answered, he had more questions about Oregon. And if you asked him outside in the setting about whether it bothered him to hear about Oregon or Michigan – I can tell by his body language the Oregon questions bothered him more than the Michigan. You know, he hasn't experienced that, that rivalry yet. Um, there will be plenty of time for that. Um, but the Oregon stuff, I think, was a little bit uh, – kind of a little bit abrasive today. He did not enjoy that. But that's the way it is. Rivalries are just a little bit different. That's one of the interesting things that Jack Velling was talking about. He was talking about how – um, you know, he's familiar with the Oregon-Oregon State rivalry, but he knows that's nothing compared to what the rivalry between Michigan and Michigan State is like. He knows that Pac-12 rivalries are different than Big Ten rivalries. Wow, he said that? That's well, interesting. Well, I think he's been ed educated on that. And he hasn't been on the field yet with them. That's no. amazing that he would, he would well, pick that up Well, I think there's been already. some talk about that, you know. They don't talk about Oregon 365 days a year, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, he said the right things. He said, you know, Sharon Moore, I pay him respect for what he was contributing the last few years at, at Michigan. He said the right things. And judging by the way Jonathan Smith uh, interacted with Dan Lanning at Oregon last year, it looked, looked very civil. It looked very mature. They were adults. So some of the crap we've seen between Michigan and Michigan State yeah. the last few years, I think that's going to be retired now to an extent. There's going to be hatred among fans, and players are going to go at it real hard. But I think uh, the coaches are going to act like, we'll like they're going to act like adults for a change, Paul. I, I think what bothered Jonathan Smith about the Oregon thing is about everything that happened. You know, like he was going on with like him, Michigan State, kind of the everyone asking whether Jonathan Smith was still going to be there during the Oregon game, that kind of stuff. That was the circus. Like, oh, you know, like everybody knows that Jonathan Smith's leaving Oregon State during the Oregon game. Uh, you know, that was Oregon fans were a little bit disrespectful, which mm -hmm. you expect. And I think just, just that rubbed him the, the wrong way. A couple questions about, like, recruiting against Oregon State, that tongue-in-cheek questions from Oregon writers to, uh, about recruiting against Oregon, you know, that kind of stuff. So – Kind of similar to what, what he'll face for Michigan uh, writers and whatnot, but the the competition level, um, the the rivalry, the nastiness, um, that's really not part of Pac-12 football. Yeah, not to this extent, probably. There, there there's some tough rivalries. Hey, I mean. But I mean, like I've talked to guys that like that have played in Washington, Washington State, the Apple Cup or whatever. It's not, it's different. I mean, there's rivalry there, but it's not hateful. Right. You know, there's hateful rivalries in the SEC in the Big Ten. It's yeah. just the way it is. I remember being out of the the Aloha Bowl in 1997. Michigan State was playing Washington. We were talking to some Washington writers, and they were saying, you know, all the Husky fans were rooting for Washington State to win the Rose Bowl that year. Yeah. <laughs> that was okay. Uh, 
to your point. All right, anything else, Paul? No. Well, football practice starts on Tuesday. Uh, we'll be ma making our way back north from Indianapolis, and we'll be covering that next week and throughout the camp. And Smith was talking about some of the competitions that are going to be taking place. Whether or not they will t update us on how those competitions are going, probably not. But there'll be a few competitions uh, taking place. And Jonathan Smith likes to play those second stringers, so there's going to be competitions to see who becomes those second stringers. You know, one of the guys that I'm interested to in, get no that one playing ever, time. everyone wants to talk about him, but the second string quarterback. Yeah, Schuster, Tommy Schuster. You know, and, and I say that because, you know, you do have a freshman quarterback or, yes. or a sophomore quarterback in Aiden Childs who's going to be really good and likely an NFL player at some point. But Tommy Schuster is a heck of a, a, heck of a backup. And, uh, you know, like – they did well to get him. Right. And there's a few of these transfers. I just feel like they did really well to get those guys. I mean, they were like smart picks. They weren't just like throwing darts at a, you know, at a dartboard or crap against a wall. I think some of those guys were really good picks. And Schuster's one of those guys I'm really interested in. Mm -hmm. And I think he's going to be, you know, I think he's going to push Childs to be better. Mm hmm just because he doesn't make mistakes. That's what John, Jonathan mm -hmm. Smith was talking about today. But also, he's seen just about everything you can see as a quarterback, and, and it's good to have those veteran backups that can help a young young quarterback along. Yeah, and, you know, Tommy Schuster coming in from North Dakota, he's limited. He's limited talent-wise. He's not real tall, and he's not real fast, but he makes good reads, and he's accurate. You know, the arm is okay. And he's tough. He's tough, and you're right. For the, coming in, they had zero quarterbacks in the roster. They knew Childs was coming in to go out to find somebody who's got experience that was willing to be kind of a number two, probably most likely. They got a good one in that category, a guy that wanted to come back home to the state of Michigan, and he is capable. Watching him for North Dakota and some of the games, I think he's like he's a good, solid, bona fide Big Ten backup quarterback. And we saw last year, Michigan State didn't have any quarterbacks. Yeah. They had three on scholarship. I mean, the guy that went to Arizona State, I forgot his name already, the guy that was from Oregon, I don't know, whatever his name was. He's got talent. He's going to be good in the future at Arizona State. The other guys, I mean, Kate Hauser, good kid, did what, he, did what he could. The accuracy wasn't always there. The arm strength was kind of so-so. Schuster might be better than Kaden Hauser right now. Well, Schuster is better than Kaden Hauser. There's no question about that. You know, yeah. like, I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's, I mean, that's facts, you know. Use a Malik Spencer overused Malik Spencer term. I mean, Caden Hauser was not that great. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, the other thing is, these guys are team first guys. I, I'm not saying that that those guys weren't like you know supportive of their teammates, but those guys were thinking about themselves. And that's part of being the quarterback. I mean, you can only one guy can play, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I do feel like you know the vibe is better. Um, you know, you've got it's hard even for like a guy like Tommy Schuster. It's hard for someone not to like Aiden Childs. You know, I, I think that'll be a good relationship, especially, a, you know, a younger quarterback and an older one. Um, and then you've got two, two uh, you know, true freshmen coming in. And, uh, but I, I think it's in, a, it's in a good spot. I think, uh, I think running back is a, a good position. I think tight end is going to be much improved. And that, that's one thing we talk about the offensive line, but I think just watching in the spring, I've already like, I've taken for granted that they're actually going to be able to run block it at tight end and get some stuff done that we haven't seen for years. I mean, I think that's going to be much improved. All right, players coming and going. I can't even remember a guy's name. They come in, they transfer out. I forget about him. I mean, he'll be, he'll be good at Arizona State. I can, still can't. Sam, what's his name? Was it Sam something? I don't know. Sam Levitt. Levitt, Sam Levitt. Is that what it was? Yeah, I don't care. He's Levitt now. He left it. He's got talent. He'll do well out there. Yeah, he, he does, but, you know, he had a chip on his shoulder because Jonathan Smith didn't recruit him. You know, that's that's the kind of thing that you got to de that you have to deal with, and it, like that's something that was a deal breaker for him. The fact that Jonathan Smith wanted Aiden Childs or had Aiden Childs and he preferred him over, you know, that's life. That's football. Yeah, they're both pretty good. So he didn't want to stay. He knew right away that when Smith was hired, he was going to be leaving. That's what he told people, and, and uh, that's what he did. So um, that's college football these days. And you know, Matt Rule had an interesting comment today. The Nebraska head coach. He says that he feels that the teams that have consistency and continuity, that keep players in the program, keep coaches, are going to do real well. That was his quote. But he, you know, he thinks that's going to, those things are going to be difference makers that allow programs to achieve. I think Michigan State wants to be in that category. I think Smith doesn't want to be a guy that's you know, going heavy on the transfer portal every single year. Meanwhile, the recruiting guys that might not be four stars, you know, they'll, they will in the future, I think, more of them. But 
Uh, you get a four star, you might have to pay for them. Then you might have to pay for them again and again. Uh, I think they want to build a foundation with people that want to be part of the program and create a brotherhood in this landscape. There will be some programs that achieve that, but it's going to be very tricky to do it. The great coaches will get that done. Yeah, and you look at like Matt Rule. They lost, they bled a ton of players his first year. So he's speaking from from experience, and I think that's one thing that everyone looks at has to, needs to pay attention to is there's going to be a lot of a lot of turnover. Um, you know, when, when there's a coaching change, because those guys have been recruit, those guys are being recruited from the time there's a, you know, anybody's on the on the hot seat. But Matt Rule, you know, he knows that from firsthand experience, um, and you know, Jonathan Smith has experienced it as well. But I'll go back to you know, you're talking about like the the three star and whatnot. I'll go back to some of the guys that D'Antonio brought in, and it's like, yeah, they're a three star, but you know that they have upside, they've got a frame, they've got speed and athleticism. You know, and I look at a guy like Wyatt Hook. Uh, tight end, three-star tight end they brought in, and just watching him walk around campus in the summertime, mm -hmm. that dude is huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, that dude looks like a man already. He runs great routes. And I know, His film is good. And I know that he's going to be able to block, um, you know, like the want to's there. But, I mean, he looks – watching him stand next to Jack Belling earlier in the summer, I'm like, okay, if that's a three-star tight end, sign, sign him up. And, you know, right. Kirk Ferentz said as much today. He was talking about tight end success. A lot of those guys that he brought in – uh, you know, guys like George Kittle and whatnot. Those guys aren't ranked high, necessarily highly, but some were walk-ons. Was yeah. Dallas Clark walk-on? Yeah, I believe so. But like, you know, it's mm -hmm. the tight end position. You can have a four-star that's just a big receiver that won't block. That's just split out wide, and then you know, like. But I look at guys like Wyatt Hook. I look at guys like that Dan, Dan Tony brought in, like guys like Danico Salen or um, you know, Tawan Jones. You know, some of the guys with, with some upside. Uh, Trenton Robinson, you know, so I don't, I don't think that, you know, there's a difference between bringing in three stars, like a Mel Tucker three star, guys you're buying from California, and the difference is, in my mind, those are three stars that you're getting at the end, mm. you know, paying money, big money for, mm. as opposed to guys that you're getting that you want early. Mm-hmm. Like some of those D'Antonio three stars. I remember that what 2011 class, 2012 recruiting class, is ranked really lowly, but they got so many guys that they wanted, um, you know, and uh, that's that's the key to me, you know, getting guys that you want and not paying for guys that that you should have gotten in the summer. And those the payments. I mean, that's a that's a decision you have to make. Also, I was listening to the Andy Staples podcast this week and made some great points. I mean, I think Oklahoma just hired a capologist. So you got this much money, a finite amount of resources. What are you going to allocate to right. freshmen? What are you going to allocate to keeping players? What are you going to allocate to the portal? And the the freshmen and a lot of programs are not getting what they got three years ago because well, you got to pay money to keep players. But it makes zero sense to me. It makes zero sense to me to pay a million dollars for a freshman. He's not going to play. But then there's no there's no way you pay that guy, and there's no keep. You know, it's not like an NFL where you pay, where you know you've got guaranteed money, but he's staying in the program. Right. You know, it's like you might pay a guy to come there. Um, you might pay a guy like Tumisi at Adelaide to come to your program as a five star. Or by Job or someone like that, or you Sam might Sam Levitt by Job. You know, you might pay those guys that, but if they're not playing, what's to keep them there? And you know, they can they can collect with with penalty free transfer. There's really no incentive for a guy to stay put if you're paying a developmental player a million dollars or six figures or whatever you're willing to pay him. But there's no there's no mechanism by which they have to stay put. So mm -hmm. it makes a lot more sense to me to pay players to stay as opposed to you know pay developmental projects, I mean, high ceiling projects, a lot of money to come to your program when, uh, you know, there's a high likelihood if they don't play, they're going to they're gonna jump to the portal mm -hmm. and uh, get paid by the next next team. I can think of some in-state players, some Midwestern players that Michigan State could probably flip right now if they presented the money. But if you do, what right. does that get you? How many snaps do you get as a freshman? Then you got to pay them again the next year. There are money decisions here. It's finite resources. So the Rutgers right now is getting a lot of four stars, and I suspect they're throwing some money around. Now, can they keep those players? Right. And I got I got a lot of respect for Rutgers and how they've built the program so far. They're going to have a good defense this year. They had a good defense last year, a good run game. If they would have had a real quarterback last year, they might have won nine games. Right. We've been so saying the, that about Rutgers for a while. Yeah, but, but the defense is better the, than the it's been. The defense is really good. You know, since they joined the Big Ten, it's the best it's been. The run game last year with Manange or whatever his name was, like was guy. the best that it's been. So the run game has slowly gotten good. The defense is good. It's kind of D'Antonio building steps. They they haven't had a Brian Hoyer or Kirk Cousins type quarterback. I don't know if they will, but um, but now, you know, it's kind of like they're jumping off track to really go after 
they're going all in on some recruiting right now. And it's an interesting play. We'll see how that turns out for them. Anything else, Paul? No. For Paul Kodak, my name is Jim Comper. You've been watching the VCast for SpartanMag.com. Check us out for continuing coverage throughout preseason camp, football season, getting ready for it, counting down. But don't wish your summer away too soon. Get out there and enjoy it and be safe and have a good time. For Kodak, my name is Comper. You've been watching the VCast from Indianapolis, SpartanMag.com.